some arcane users believe in preservation, that there are things in this world too important and must be protected at all cost. But you know that's nonsense. Preservation equals stagnation. In order for things to grow anew, the old must be burned away. Today, we're talking about the Circle of Wildfire Druid. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today we're doing it. We're talking about the Circle of Wildfire Druid. Multiple of you out there have requested this for the subclass Deep Dive, especially due to some allusions that I made in my Tasha's Cauldron of Everything review link up there. And uh, yeah, we're, we're finally going to talk about it. So to start things off, we're going to do a class overview of, of this subclass. And why I like it, I think this is a super cool subclass in terms of its flavor and its theming and how it combines a lot of really cool things from fantasy archetypes together. So first off, obviously this takes the idea of fire and healing and brings it together, which, you know, makes almost too much sense, the, the cleansing fire. Um, and, and I mean, that, that even translates to our modern era and our modern sensibilities with things like controlled burns, uh, where I grew up, that was a very common thing to occur of burning away the old vegetation to allow for new things to grow. So yeah, this makes a lot of sense. And I like bringing together the, the pyromancer and the healer together, uh, to be a really cool combo class and, you get a, a wildfire spirit that you can bring along on the journey. So you're a, a healer, a pyromancer, and a summoner all brought together into one. And the, the spells that you get very much follow that line of fire and healing. You get class abilities that augment spells that heal or do fire damage. And everything about this class really orbits those three pillars of the subclass. Uh, fire damage, healing and the wildfire spirit. And I think it all works together really well. And I think there are a number of really interesting stories you can tell with this subclass. I think you can, you can take it a lot of different directions and the subclass will kind of fully support whatever kind of storytelling you want to do with it. So let's get into the class features and break them down level by level. You obviously get this at second level when the Druid picks their circle. And first off, you gain access to the spell list. Now with these, they count as prepared uh, as you gain them as you level. They don't count against your normal number of prepared spells. They're just always prepared for you. Um, obviously casting them uses a spell slot, yada, yada, yada. Like a lot of the, the subclass spell lists, it, it works very similarly to that. And at um, second level, you get burning hands and cure wounds. So right out of the gate, we have that dichotomy present of Burning hands, obviously shooting fire from your hands and cure wounds, like being able to heal people, uh, placing your hands on them to, to imbue them with healing energy. And from the outset, this is going to become a theme. And, and you all know me, if you've been watching those videos, I'm all about reflavoring, recontextualizing things to fit the theming of the subclass. And so obviously when you when you're talking about a subclass like the circle of wildfire and you you first introduce the two spells you get on the spell list are burning hands and cure wounds both requiring the use of your hands obviously if i'm playing the subclass i'm flavoring both of them as the the flames coming out of my hands the the warmth coming out of them so even if i'm curing wounds it's still fire it's still fire cleansing away whatever damage or a uh, harmful thing is causing your hit points to be lower and, and I'm burning that away for you. And so that's absolutely how I would, I would play this and how I would run with it. And obviously burning hand speaks for itself of you're just fully unleashing that fire as opposed to controlling it in, in the healing capacity. And I think that is the theming all the way through is you, you are always using fire in my brain with this subclass. It's just whether or not you're controlling it, whether or not you're controlling it to be helpful or you're unleashing it to be harmful. 
And then additionally, of course, at second level, you can summon your wildfire spirit. So as an action, you can expend one use of your wild shape feature to have your, your wildfire spirit appear within 30 feet of you and any creatures except for you within 10 feet of the space that it appears in must succeed on a deck saving throw equal to your spell save DC or take 2d6 fire damage. So not only are you summoning it, but you're kind of getting, it's not a lost action in terms of, of combat action economy. You can still deal damage by having your wildfire spirit uh, be summoned in the thick of things next to the dangerous enemies and they have to pass their deck saving throw or 2d6 damage. So it's, it's kind of like um, a slightly lessened version of fireball that you can have hang around and continue to fight afterwards. Uh, but yeah, this, uh, the, the monster card is using your prof proficiency bonus for a lot of the aspects of it. So it can, so you can be assured that it grows in power with you. Like it's hit points uh, is five times your, uh, your level, your druid level. Uh, a lot of its attacks are based off of your proficiency bonus. So it becomes more effective as attacking as you level. So these things are designed to level with you in a really intentional and really well thought out way. Uh, for me with the wildfire spirit in particular, the one kind of highlight ability is it does have a short teleportation ability where it can take, um, itself and allies 15 feet away. And that's not nothing. If you need to get an ally out of a really bad spot and out of the, the threatened zone, because don't forget it's teleportation, then you can do that. You can get them out, have your wildfire spirit run in, use their action to teleport them away. So it, there's a lot of really cool utility with the, with the wildfire spirit out of the gate. So I, I really like it. And you can, you can make the wildfire spirit look like whatever you want it to look like. They, they talked about a humanoid made of gnarled branches or obviously an animal of some kind. It does count as a small elemental is the, the proper classification of it, but you could get really creative with what your wildfire spirit looks like. And, and you should. And then at third level, you gain two more spells from the spell list, flaming spear and scorching ray. Obviously these two are fire damage based spells. Uh, they're very different different in terms of themes because flaming sphere is obviously this very controlled sphere that you're moving around and it it catches things on fire very slowly where scorching ray is just your you're blasting things with ray uh rays that that deal fire damage so yeah obviously no healing spell here so this is very uh, offensively minded but we'll see at the next time that you gain uh spells from your spell list they kind of balance things out but obviously both of these are fire-based spells, so you can't say they don't make sense. Uh, I mean, and and as a druid, you obviously have access to other healing spells and, and you can you can definitely go that direction with it in your normal leveling and gaining other spells. So I'm not too brokenhearted that they only went fire-based with this one, just because they do make up for it at fifth level when you gain more spells. And you, you still have access to all the other druid spell list spells. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sweating it too much, uh, but you know, it, it is balanced one direction pretty heavily. So at fifth level, you gain plant growth and revivify as your two spells on the spell list that now count as prepared. So obviously the, like I said, from third level, this is the, the, the pendulum swing back the other direction and plant growth makes a lot of sense for any druid to be perfectly honest, uh, where you can either, uh, spend eight hours making the land, like look more healthy and, and, and all that kind of stuff, or in a much more uh, direct and focused fashion, basically make terrain more difficult for people to, to walk through because of the, the thick, uh, regrowth that you are cultivating. And then revivify is obviously your, your light resurrection, <laughs> spell. But once again, uh, plant regrowth falls perfectly in line with the rest of the druidic thinking. So I don't think you necessarily need to reflavor it too much. Maybe you could, if, if you really wanted to get neck deep into the fire as a restorative property thing, you could with the plant regrowth, like have fire shoot out of your hands, like burning hand style and burn everything away. And then in an instant, 
the regrowth begins because you burned away the old and the new can come in unencumbered. So I, I do like that from a flavor standpoint, if you want to go that direction. And then obviously revivify, reigniting the inner spark of the soul, um, having like even like emitting fire into the mouth and nostrils to where they inhale it and it brings them back to life would all be really cool ways of flavoring this. But like I said, you, you've got a really cool theme here of, of fire equaling regrowth and rebirth and all this stuff. So just run with it. Don't don't just say I cast revivify, like use the fire to bring them back. And and I think that this subclass will really shine and, and glow as it were. And if if you pick up that ball and run with it. So I do like these two spells. And plant regrowth was one that initially struck me as just kind of like, oh, that's a that's a druid spell. But when you think about it in terms of the theming of burning the, away the old so that the new can grow, it does make thematic sense. I wonder if there are other spells out there that aren't quite so druidy that you could include um, to to expand the spell list a bit more. I don't dislike plant regrowth. It just seems very, very much like a druid spell, whereas everything else is is kind of very unique to this subclass, or at least from a theming standpoint, feels very targeted for this subclass. So that's really my only gripe with these two spells. At sixth level, you have the enhanced bond class feature. So your your bond with your wildfire spirit is growing. And so when, when they are summoned, when you cast a spell that either deals fire damage or restores hit points, you can roll a d8 and add that number to one roll for either the fire damage or the the healing spell. So you roll you roll the d8 and it lands on a three. One of the d6s that you're rolling for damage gets a plus three onto it. Uh, is basically how that works. And so yeah, I I like this. I I think it's it's a cool way to to develop that connection between you and your wildfire spirit. I get why they didn't go with the just add a d8 to to the rolls because then if you crit then then there's a doubling thing and so this this keeps it very separate uh from a mechanic standpoint but i i do like how they are really pushing through the mechanics this bond with your wildfire spirit because the capstone ability of this subclass really speaks to that bond or at least it can from a narrative standpoint uh as i alluded to in my tasha's cauldron of everything review and so I do like it. I like the the growth of it. And I, I think it makes sense that the, the your wildfire spirit elevates your ability. Like you are calling on the the literal essence of wildfire, as it were, to bolster your your either the destruction of the old or the restoration of the new. And so yeah, I think that this class feature, while on its surface is very mundane i guess like you're rolling a d8 and adding the number to two very specific kinds of spells when you have this creature summoned if you strip all the theming away it it can feel very just okay uh but i think in the context of the subclass and the theme they're going for it does make a lot of sense and if played beyond the mechanics that you are developing this strong bond after four levels of of summoning this spirit that yeah it 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 begins to develop that that strong bond and this is something it's a perfect time to talk about two different ways that you can play the wildfire spirit either you are a druid that can call on the essence of wildfire and summon multiple spirits it's not a singular spirit that you're summoning but rather there's a whole army or you're, you're drawing on the conceptual notion of wildfire. And so the spirit looks different every time, acts different every time. That's one way that you can play it. I would be inclined to have it be tied to you. Have it be like your, your kindred spirit, as it were. So, uh, a spirit that's tied to you and your connection to wildfire. And so every time you summon it, it's the same spirit returning to fight by your side so that that bond can develop in both a a flavor standpoint and a mechanic standpoint side by side. That's definitely how I would choose to play it uh, because also that opens up so many storytelling opportunities down the road. 
uh, if it's the singular spirit that you're calling to to help you, then I and and it's tied to your your rebirth through the fire, as it were, your soul as it stands in in regards to the wildfire. I think that that from a, a flavor and a storytelling standpoint is so interesting and so cool, and can can be played for interesting effect down the road. At seventh level, you get two more spells, Aura of Life and Fire Shield. So we talked about Fire Shield last uh, subclass deep dive with the armorer that, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. It is interesting because with Fire Shield, you get the choice between it being fire or ice, what you're shielding. And so it is interesting that you can, you can make that choice from a mechanic standpoint with the the wildfire the circle of wildfire druid i probably would never pick the ice option if i were playing this just because i'm i'm that kind of committed to the flavor and committed to the theming kind of player uh, but yeah that is an option that you have with the fire shield shield spell as written to protect yourself uh from fire or cold as it were and then Aura of Life, I love me an Aura. I, I think Auras are are great and underutilized from both a, a class design and a monster design standpoint. And this one is no different. Uh, I would definitely flavor it as a ring of fire, a, a ring of life-giving fire around you as you run around the battlefield. And and the, the way that I love this Aura, the way it can be used, is the idea of like somebody at zero hit points getting restored back to one just by being in your aura. So you, if, if you're on the verge of a TPK, you can activate this and literally run through the battlefield and just get your party members at least on their feet. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, I think both these spells make a lot of sense. The, the fire shield does present an interesting problem just because you, you don't want to like give the caveat when you're adding something to a spell list of like fire shield, but only the fire version. But certainly, if I were playing the subclass, I would just stick to the fire version of Fire Shield. Oh, and something I forgot to mention with the sixth level spell. Um, additionally, with that enhanced bond, your wildfire spirit can become the origin point of your spell for any target other than self. So, so in terms of range or target that you're, you're within five feet of, all that kind of stuff, your wildfire spirit can be the origin point for your spells because of your bond. Sorry, totally forgot to mention that, but yeah, moving on. At ninth level, you gain Flame Strike and Mass Cure Wounds. So Flame Strike is obviously you're calling down a column of fire that deals both fire damage and radiant damage. And yeah, I mean, the spells that you gain at ninth level are the last spells that you get as part of this subclass. And I can't think of a better capstone spell than being able to call down a column of fire when you are a subclass known for dealing fire damage. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I it's it's interesting that like a, a lot of you might point out like, well, where's fireball and where are these other like kind of iconic fire spells? And while yes, you you could take those through other means, I do think that flame strike like calling down this column a flame with kind of this righteousness so much so that it also deals radiant damage in addition to fire damage makes a lot more sense than just being able to fling a ball of fire. Uh, so yeah, I, I like it. And I think that thematically it, it is kind of the perfect capstone spell for this class to go alongside mass cure wounds, which I, I don't know if we need to get too deep into uh, why this spell makes sense. Obviously, once again, Flavor these two things side by side, whereas it's either controlled or it's unleashed, where you're you're calling down a column of fire either way. You look up into the sky and pull down this column of fire, and it's either destroying your enemies or imbuing your allies with renewed vigor to fight on. And I think that from a flavor standpoint, that can that can be so evocative and so cool for your party members. This idea that all of your spells have two different uh two different uses essentially like that, that they're all two sides of the same coin even going back to like flaming sphere and scorching ray versus plant growth and revivify those are two different spell or uh levels that you get those spells but flaming sphere could be the sphere that goes around and burns away the old plant growth and in its trail 
new plant growth uh, crops up and Scorching Ray, like you're with your your desperation for your ally to come back, your your rays of fire like go into their chest and begin to reignite their body kind of thing. There's so many interesting ways that you can you can flavor these spells to work hand in hand with both the the harm and the heal aspects. Before we move on, if you are enjoying this video, please give it a thumb up and subscribe to the channel. It does help out a whole heck of a lot. In fact, we are on the path to 2000 subscribers. And when we hit that point, I'm going to buy one of you a D&D book of your choosing. We'll do a, a drawing giveaway when we hit that point. But the first step that you need to take to getting a D&D book of your very own is subscribing down below. So go down there, subscribe. We'd love to have you uh, come check out videos as they come out. And if you want to talk to me about this stuff in real time, I do stream on Twitch every Sunday and Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central and Saturdays at 8 a.m. And yeah, we just play games, talk about D&D, &D, and have a good time. So come by, hang out. I would love to have you. At 10th level, you gain the Cauterizing Flames uh, class ability. And this one, when a small or larger creature dies within 30 feet of either yourself or your Wildfire Spirit in that creature's space where they were once standing they there is a spectral flame that's that's harmless that just lingers in their spot for one minute and if at any point a creature occupies that space you can use your reaction to extinguish the flame and either deal fire damage or restore hit points either way it's 2d10 plus your wisdom modifier is what you're you're dealing whether it's restoring or hurting and yeah, so you could have a party member just like moving on their turn and move through the flame, reaction, boom, and then they can continue on. So yeah, I think that's really interesting and a really cool ability that can, it, it almost feels video gamey, if I'm being perfectly honest. The idea of when you've, when you've killed something, something lingers above their corpse and you can run through and gain health kind of thing or or if your enemies run through they take damage i obviously i'm not i'm not dogging it because of that that's just kind of what it evokes in my mind when i think about this ability but i think it's it's really it's a really interesting ability and i think that it can be very effective and kind of the idea that once again your your tie to the fire is also tied to your capacity to heal others and yourself and the idea of harming life to the point where it is extinguished and it's just that last lingering bit of flame holding on and you have hit a point where you get to dictate what happens with that flame. Does it heal or does it hurt? Which does it do? And so it's like you're gaining this higher like understanding of your own powers and manipulating life and death as it relates to the fire and so yeah i think that's really evocative and a really cool story that could be told through leveling and you can do that a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus uh, per long rest so there, there is a limitation on the number of times that you can summon the spectral flame and yeah that's not a huge thing proficiency bonus uh, it makes a lot of sense to have have it be a limiting factor on an ability that can still grow with you 14th level Blazing Revival. So this is what I was referencing as, as like this subclass having the potential for tragic storytelling at a table. Because the way I said before that I would play the, the wildfire spirit of being the singular spirit that's tied to your soul, to your essence, as it were, as it relates to the fire. I would, I would have that come to a head with this ability being used the first time where the, the ability itself is if your spirit is within 120 feet of you and you drop to zero hit points to the point where you fall unconscious, you can cause your spirit to drop to zero hit points and then you instantly regain half of your hit points and you rise to your feet. And I think that this is a great capstone ability from a mechanic standpoint, having that, oh crap, I need backup uh, button makes a lot of sense. You can do this once per long rest, by the way. But from a storytelling standpoint, I would absolutely have it be a heartbreaking moment of 
your spirit giving up its its life for you so that you can continue on and having that be the end of the road for the spirit in that form obviously not doing away with your wildfire spirit ability but the next time you summon your wildfire spirit it's different because you're different because it was tied to your essence and your essence has now changed because your wildfire spirit gave its life so that you could continue on and that's definitely how i played this ability that's what that's what i thought of the first time i read the blazing revival uh mechanics was oh this could be really sad if if you've had this super friendly super emotive wildfire spirit with you regardless of what form it, it comes in i mean obviously the artwork in the book it's like a, a fire fox that runs by by the side of the druid if you've been running with that fox for 14 levels, 15 levels, 16 levels, whatever point after you've hit 14th level that you need to use this ability. And from a storytelling standpoint, you decide to, uh, to play it like the, the, the fiery Fox is, is giving up its life. It's as an essence to save you. Um, there, there are some tables where you're going to, you're going to have some party members choking back tears a little bit, I would imagine. But I, I think that that could be a really cool storytelling moment. And, and then the next time, and, and, and I would, I know it says you choose, but I certainly wouldn't have be the choice of your, your druid. Like when they wake up that they either don't realize what's happened until they go to summon their wildfire spirit. They're like, Oh, where'd they go? Well, I'll call them back. And it's, it's now an owl or a raccoon or, or something like that. And like, who are you kind of thing? And, and then you can start the process all over again. Obviously, mechanically, you have all, every, everything, all the bond and, and all that stuff. But from a storytelling standpoint, you start over again. And I think that's really cool and can be really compelling. So playing this subclass. So this subclass really exists in two main kind of pillars of thought for me of on one side, this whole theming around destruction and rebirth and that being the, the essence of of that part of it. And then the other part is a super cool pet slash companion that you can summon. So those are kind of the two sides of it that you can play, uh, really play up, but I don't think they exist divorced from one another. I think that they, they can walk hand in hand in a single character that is this very kind of radical, um, radical ideology of like, in order to, for a new, ideology a new world a new civilization to come about the old must be burned down kind of thing i think would be uh, a way to play this subclass that can make a lot of sense um additionally having like like a strong dislike of the undead would make a lot of sense for this subclass because you're you're holding on and preserving something that is meant to be dead that is meant to have been let go of and allow for something new to to come about so finding those little things that they would be like set off by, like the concept of undead makes a lot of sense for this subclass. But additionally, the, the strong bond with the wildfire spirit, I think could be really be the highlight of playing this subclass, having that companion that you are, it, it's like, it's like a ranger with, with their, their pet. If you, if you have a ranger that has a pet that you level up with and, and go through all this stuff with it's it's a very similar concept except mechanically you you could have like a sacrifice mechanic built in at 14th level like i referenced so yeah i i think it's a really interesting subclass and i think there's a multitude of ways that you can play it but the big thing is finding finding those touch points that they become passionate and and fiery as it were about like like undead as i mentioned or if, if like old, old school institutions set them off, it's like, no, like they're, they're stifling creativity. They're stifling new ways of thought. That's the kind of mindset that I see going along with this subclass of burn it all down so that new things can come about. So in terms of parties for this subclass, a, a group of young radicals that are looking to change the world in a meaningful way, this subclass would be perfect for a party like that. Uh, from a conceptual standpoint in that type of campaign of trying to take down a corrupt or evil organization or government and trying to fight 
against it from a very passionate and and fiery <laughs> place makes a lot of sense. Also a classic druidic style party with maybe some rangers or uh, Oath of the Ancients Paladin or, or something like that thrown in for the mix of, of protecting the woods, protecting nature. But your druid having a, a new way of thinking about that, about the, the best way to protect the nature is to destroy it in a controlled manner, to allow new things to grow through destroying that which is stagnating. And so in, in displaying it as very much kind of this natural cycle, I think it'd be a very cool way of playing the subclass in a very cool party that you could exist in. And lastly, how to DM for this subclass. So this one, I, I would talk to the player, or if you're a player, talk to your DM, but this is the DMing section. So talk to the player about the role that you play in relation to the, the spirit when it's summoned. Because I would I would ask the player if it's okay if I as the DM role play the spirit, not control the spirit, not like mechanically, it's all it's all you. But let me role play it. Let me imbue it with personality and emote. And once again, allow the player to define all of that stuff. What do you want them to be like? Describe their personality to me, but then allow me to bring them to life so that you can play off of them so that we can have those back and forth moments, uh, even though it can't speak a language, but still having that, that back and forth and developing that bond can go a long way on the road to developing the spirit as a fully realized character, or if they're going with multiple spirits, all of them, like uh, allow, allow for different personalities to come through. And maybe you have a whole menagerie of spirits that you call upon. That could be a really cool way to play this as well. And, and it could still pack the emotional uh, punch, as it were, with Blazing Revival because you're losing a member of your menagerie kind of thing. So what did you all think? Did Does this make you want to play the Circle of Wildfire Druid? I love this subclass. I think it's so cool. And I think there's so many amazing storytelling opportunities to be had with it. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Once again, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. It does help out more than you know. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.